Many people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do so. Bertrand Russell. Edgar Mitchell, former astronaut who walked on the moon in 1971 during Apollo 14, has since become a major public advocate in the growing worldwide UFO movement. He speaks at UFO conventions all over the world. In a 1998 London Times News article, Mitchell is described as believing that aliens have landed on the Earth, and he has intensified his campaign to persuade Washington to acknowledge life beyond our skies. Mitchell argues that life is almost certain to exist on any other planet with a supportive environment. Some physicists, he points out, now believe it is possible to actually travel faster than the speed of light. He is 90% certain that many of the thousands of UFOs recorded since the 1940s belong to visitors from another planet. Although some have been delusions and others natural phenomena, too many remain unexplained, he said. This suggests there are humanoids manning craft which have characteristics not in the arsenal of any nation on Earth that we know of. This is very alarming, he said. Edgar Mitchell holds a PhD from MIT and stands to be a perfect candidate in this particular NASA UFO investigation. Mitchell says his research, including conversations with people who have worked in intelligence agencies and military groups, have convinced him that the American government has covered up the truth about UFOs for 50 years. I thought if I sent um, Edgar Mitchell the, the tether footage from STS-75 that he could clearly see that we were looking at the largest UFOs ever captured on film. I wrote Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell in October of 1999. On November 24, 1999, Edgar Mitchell wrote me the following letter. David Sarita, yes, I have received your film and reviewed it and the info package you provided. I see utterly nothing about the tether incident that is particularly interesting. If there is more revealing footage, then I will look at it. However, I have looked at many feet of space film and have yet to see only one that has anything worth looking into regarding UFO appearances. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. I could not accept the idea that such a great proponent of UFOs was so adamantly against the suggestion that these giant circles passing behind the tethered satellite were UFOs. He was shrugging off the most astounding piece of video ever witnessed of UFOs in the history of the space program. I couldn't believe it. Dr. Mitchell, who was an MIT PhD, could not even acknowledge that the disks were clearly going behind the 12 mile length of the tether. He couldn't even see that very simple fact. I think just about any moron can tell the difference between when a disc is going behind this piece of wood and when it's going in front of it. That's in front, that is behind. This is not in front, this is behind. And that's exactly how they appear. Why couldn't Edgar Mitchell see this point? I decided to try to argue the points with Mitchell more precisely. He wrote me back almost immediately. David, at first glance they are just particles, perhaps outgassed, I do not know, but I certainly would look for a more prosaic explanation than UFOs. If you have a better film, I will look at it, but I am not very optimistic that they are anything exotic. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell wrote to me that he thought the objects were just particles, perhaps outgassed from the, from the space shuttle. How does a particle appear to be visible from over 77 miles away. We're looking, the cameras on the space shuttle are, are at least 77 miles away and drifting past 100 miles. How do you see just little particles of dust floating by that appear as perfect giant circles with notches cut out of the side, clearly passing behind the tether, pulsing with very sophisticated uh, wave patterns? How do particles behave like this? Uh, maybe I have to relearn and reinvestigate uh, particle theory to understand some of these ideas, these ridiculous ideas that some of these scientists are coming up with. He wrote me back the following letter on December 3rd, 1999. David Sarita, I remain open-minded, but I saw nothing on the tape you sent that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether. 
Also in the footage of the tether, the commentator on the spacecraft is making a running commentary for really anything of significance in space around the tether at that time. Don't you think they would have been saying something about it? If they were as big as you say, they would have been visible to the naked eye and surely reported, not ignored as seems to be the case. You comment about no infrared images. Of course not. If nothing is there, how could there be an infrared image? Signed, Edgar Mitchell. The first point that Dr. Mitchell makes here is that I saw nothing on the tape that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether reveals that he is ignoring just how defined the edges of these huge discs are and how sharply defined they are as they travel behind the very clear edges of the tether. More precisely about the tether, we remember the Huntsville, Alabama NASA operator asking the crew and how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? The 12 mile long tether cable was only a tenth of a centimeter in thickness and should not have been visible from over 77 miles away. There was no answer to why the, it appeared so thick because the shuttle astronauts did not know the answer then. But on Wednesday, February 28th, 1996, of the NASA STS-75 Day 7 highlights, they recorded the very reasons as the scientists report that they can measure sunlit-induced electrical charge on the tether and satellite as it moves through the daylight and night portions of its orbit around the Earth. Because the tether was charged with energy constantly by the highly charged particles in space and from the ionosphere, it produced a magnetic field around it which became sunlit and very visible. But also the report revealed that nitrogen gas from the satellite had been emptied and the gas would have become ionized, which could have produced a neon tube-like effect. This all explained precisely why the tether appeared so thick from so far away. It had nothing to do with the glare or out-of-focus theories. Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. Satellite uh, now. 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. I tried to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude. Thank you. I'm going to zoom in now. So precisely, the UFOs can be seen passing behind the thickness of the tethers, sunlit induced electrical charge, and ionized gas. The light shining off of the tether and the energized field obscures the light shining from the UFOs precisely because the UFOs are passing behind the tethered satellite. These are all facts that Dr. Mitchell was unaware of. This view uh, showing uh, the satellite. Dr. Mitchell was obviously not considering the NASA astronauts talking about the UFOs on alternate Department of Defense encrypted radio channels, probably because they did not have them during his own Apollo 14 mission to the moon. During long pauses between words, we might assume that the astronauts and NASA control operators are talking on Department of Defense secure channels encrypted to prevent anyone from tapping into their conversations about classified information, such as unidentified flying objects. When Dr. Mitchell finished by saying, you comment on no infrared image, of course not. If nothing is there, how could there be an infrared image? Dr. Mitchell was obviously completely unaware of how objects that are vibrating with electromagnetic energy higher in frequency than the human eye can see such as the near ultraviolet range of light, can actually exist but be undetectable in the visible and infrared ranges of light. Perhaps such observations required advanced ideas in quantum physics that he was not prepared to accept at the time. On February 18, 1999, I received the following letter from Dr. Joseph Newt III. Dear Mr. Sarita, I did look carefully at the video you sent and I really must apologize to you for not replying sooner. 
The objects that were on the video appear to me to be floating debris from the cargo bay of the space shuttle. These objects often appear to be fuzzy because they got quite close to the camera and were often out of focus." End quote. The test that you just saw, I showed the video camera here on a tripod and I held a, a set of keys only four or five inches away from the camera and you could see that they were very in focus. In the background, somewhere around 100 feet away, was the tree that you saw. The point that Dr. Newth makes about the video cameras on the space shuttle, that objects as they got close to the camera appeared very fuzzy and became out of focus and, and some disappearing altogether, doesn't seem to really hold up here because video cameras don't actually work the same way optical cameras do. A regular 35 millimeter camera, as you're focused on a distant object, as objects come close to the camera, they get very fuzzy. In fact, they can disappear altogether. But it's not the case with uh, video cameras that have CCD imaging um, chips inside of them that actually process the images in a very different way than 35 millimeter cameras do. We have to assume, and from studies I've made into the video cameras used on the space shuttle, that they're very high-tech, very high-quality cameras. Many of them are off-the-shelf cameras, but they're, they're retrofitted with more advanced chips inside of them and also image intensifiers and special filters. So the camera that we just did the test on was a very high-tech camera, but certainly you can imagine that what they're using on the space shuttle is even better. So why, in this scene that we just did, do a pair of keys appear so crisp and sh so sharp and in focus at the same time we're focused on a very, very distant object? It seems to defy the explanations and reasoning Dr. Newth gave as to what we were seeing on the tape. James Olberg um, came up with excuses about what we were seeing. He couldn't acknowledge that the objects were going behind the tether. He just ignored the facts, the simple facts. He tried to say that what we were seeing was an optical illusion produced by the CCD in the video camera. He's trying to say that as, as these objects came near to the camera and they got close, they produced this fuzzy orb called an airy disk. When an object gets too close, to a video camera or to a lens in a 35 millimeter camera, for example, it just basically produces a very fuzzy and very soft light. It's very translucent and in some cases barely even detectable. They basically look like this. Sometimes they have a little black hole in the middle, just like our alleged UFOs do, and you get a very fuzzy kind of cloudy light around them. But all of the light is out of focus. So I can understand how he could make an assumption like that. But also with an airy disk phenomena, you would also never get a clear, very distinct line. When we see the UFOs going behind the tether, the line and the crispness on the line on the tether is so straight and so perfect, suggesting again that everything is in focus. When I demonstrated the test on the camera earlier, where we passed a set of keys very close, within four or five inches of the camera, while well, the camera was focused at an object far in the distance, we noticed that the keys were very much in focus. There was no airy disk around the keys. We didn't get an effect like this. We had keys that were perfectly in focus while the tree in the background was also in focus. So what was James Olberg trying to tell me? In the year 2000, I did a lot of investigations from, with different scientists all over the world. I got contacted by an astronomer, actually the head astronomer of the of the Canberra Observatory in Australia, Claire Williams. She had already seen the tether footage. She had already seen the STS-75 tether footage. She didn't have a very good copy of it, and we got into a furious debate about airy disks. She felt that what we were seeing on the tape in the tether were just airy disks. Airy disks are when you have like a star or a pinpoint light source, and the camera lens goes way out of focus. It produces something very similar to the UFOs that we've seen on the tape. You see a very soft black hole in the middle and a very translucent disk around, around the, the pinpoint light source. So what happens is the light becomes so diffused in the lens because it's so out of focus that we get this phenomenon called airy disk. And, and when many people would look at this, they would say, oh, that looks a lot like the UFOs we've seen on the tape. And I understand how Claire Williams came to these, these conclusions. But there's no way that an airy disk could appear to pass behind. And remember, in the tether incident, we had the tether, which is over you know, 77 to 100 miles away, 
and we saw the disc going behind it. They were not going in front of it. Once a camera lens is completely out of focus on a light source, air, all the light is out of focus. So you would have no, there's no way you would get a sharp line on the tether and then you'd get an airy disc separate from that. And if the two fused together, you would just get a lot of blurry, blurry light. When we did the test earlier with the video camera similar to the quality they're using on the space shuttle, in fact the cameras on the space shuttle are much better quality than the camera we did this test on, we held a pair of keys only four or five inches in front of the camera while the camera was focused on a tree uh, 100 or 200 feet away. Both were in perfect focus. That's because the depth of field of the actual camera, if this is the camera here, the video camera here, and, and the light is coming into it, what is known as depth of field is when a lens focuses on an object, say we focus on, a, on, on this CD right here, this compact disc right here, basically once we're in focus on this object on a regular camera, from that point on you have something called depth of field, meaning if you focus on this point, as objects get further and further behind it, depending on the aperture of the lens of the camera, a smaller aperture gives you greater depth of field, objects start to fall out of focus as they get further and further away. The same thing happens when you're focused with a regular camera on something far away, like the tether. The tether was 77 miles away and drifting into 100, and then something came close to the camera, very close, it would actually just appear as a very soft blur of lights, which is what an airy disk is. Depending on how bright the object was, it, you might get a little bit of a brighter disk. But again, these disks, and you'll see some footage of them from the spatial of what real airy disks look like, they're very distorted, very, very out of focus. You don't get details when a camera goes that far out of focus. Now the video camera is very different than a normal camera. The video camera doesn't have a film plane, it has sensors called CCDs. The CCDs in modern video cameras, such as those used on the space shuttle in the 1990s, are very similar to the cameras that we did the test on, with the pair of keys and the tree in the background. With CCDs, as objects come close to the lens, while the camera is focused on a distant object, you get phenomenal depth of field, meaning the object coming close to the camera, in this case the keys were only four inches away from the camera, were perfectly in focus, at the same time the tree was also in focus. So, you could not possibly get an airy disc with a camera like this. You would have to turn all of the camera's uh, light out of focus to get an airy disc. And in this case, we know the tether was in focus, and therefore, anything coming near the camera should produce a very crisp image. So Clara Williams' theory in regards to airy disc didn't make sense to me. Across uh, the Atlantic Ocean over uh, Africa. The image we are seeing now shows what are true airy disks. This happens because the light reflecting off of a number of very bright objects is totally out of focus. The shuttle's cameras here are way out of focus, so we notice that we cannot make any distinctions about what we are seeing with clear features. But if we watch very closely, we can see that the space shuttle's video camera is going further and further out of focus very quickly, precisely as a large, brightly glowing object, which is pulsing, traveling on a 45 degree plane from left to top right and out of frame. Could the camera operator have intentionally moved the camera out of focus to avoid capturing this unidentified flying object as it flew by at close range to the shuttle during a live NASA broadcast? We can barely identify this amazing object so similar to the disc-shaped UFO seen during the tether incident. In the test demonstrated, the only case this can happen using the shuttle's video cameras is when the camera lens is put far out of focus. When the video camera lens is in focus on a distant object such as the tethered satellite 77 to 100 miles away, objects coming near the camera lens do not go out of focus. Therefore, they simply cannot produce airy disks. Also, more precisely, an airy disk cannot appear to pass behind an object 77 to 100 miles away, such as the tether satellite, or any distance away because they only appear when the lens is far out of focus. And when the lens is out of focus, we cannot make any distinctions about what we are seeing. Also, when you consider the number of things that look like this, in this case we have a CD, a compact disc, we all know what these are now, 
They look very similar, but they're not the same thing. A tire also has a hole in the middle and it has its wheel shaped. UFOs are classically disc shaped. This is what they normally look like. So because things look similar, we can't make the mistake of assuming that they're all the same thing because they look like they're the same thing. So anyway, in this debate, Clara Williams absolutely would not concede that what we were seeing were UFOs. But she did admit to me that she's mystified by this subject because she herself has actually seen UFOs. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics. Why was this investigation on NASA UFOs moving into quantum physics? because without some basic understanding of magnetism, gravity, and light integrated into quantum ideas, the next observations about the UFOs would be impossible to comprehend. We were about to study phenomena that only quantum physics could explain. On the night of January the 10th, 2000, a giant new theory in quantum physics exploded into my mind with crystal clarity. The theory would prove that gravity is grading in frequencies that eventually at higher frequencies would go far beyond light speed and that those higher frequencies of gravity would conquer the vast diameter of our own galaxy, a hundred thousand light years in one second and then in zero time. Eventually the theory would show how the highest frequencies of gravity could conquer the distance of the entire universe in zero time. Thus gravity at this highest frequency would be the only force that is truly beyond space and time. A brand new theory in quantum physics exploded into my mind with crystal clarity. The theory would prove that eventually electromagnetism and gravity waves would go far beyond the speed of light, eventually conquering the vast distances of space in zero time. It seemed like an impossible theory. Einstein said that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Nikola Tesla, who preceded Einstein, the inventor of the alternating current generators, radio and over a hundred other US patents said that energy waves were vibrating many times faster than the speed of light in the higher ethers and that eventually those waves slowed down to what we now know the electromagnetic spectrum and became visible light waves. He did experiments that actually proved his hypothesis but his theories were ignored as the world was heralding Einstein as a great genius. Einstein put the limit on us of light speed and there was just no way in my mind I could accept the idea that extraterrestrial civilizations would travel as slow as light speed from 4.3 light years away from Earth, Alpha Centauri A and B, and Sirius A and B stars 8.7 light years from Earth. That was too long to take a trip to go find out who your neighbors were. There must be something called beyond light speed and it must actually exist and these UFOs must be utilizing energy technologies and propulsion systems that allow them to break the speed of light. Before I actually looked at the, the waves that were pulsating from the UFOs, I actually had this new theory in physics. And, it, and the, th the theory doesn't, it doesn't go against traditional wave theory. It's a new way of looking at waves in a way that is not contradictory at all to the formations of our own galaxy and our own universe. Traditionally, waves, as we saw before, were looked at on their side, and as they oscillated faster and faster and faster per second, we saw an increase in energy. It was Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics, who said, and I quoted him earlier, that energy was equal to the, to the frequency of the oscillation of a wave. The H really stands for one hertz. So, one hertzian wave, one oscillation of a wave represented one hertz. Later, the H in Planck's formula became known as Planck's constant, which became identified as a quanta of photons. But actually, Max Planck didn't really believe in photons. He believed in waves. It was Einstein who came along later criticizing Max Planck and saying that really there were photons, there were mass particles. And I told, we, we discussed earlier how we went from E equals HF as the main theory in physics, to E equals mc squared, mass, times the speed of light squared. So 
Today, both theories are actually respected, and more people are leaning towards observations in quantum mechanics, in quantum energy. Um, what I'm about to show you is, is an absolute breakthrough in wave theory. It will, it will appear very simple as I explain it, but in the outcome, you'll see how we actually break the speed of light. I call the theory gravity beyond light speed theory because looking into the core of a galaxy, looking at a galaxy, I finally understood what was going on. If a galaxy was working perfectly and created the largest amounts of energy in existence uh, known to science, then there must be something about the galaxy that could reveal to us how, how we could reach these tremendous levels of energy required to go beyond the speed of light. So looking at a galaxy, I felt I understood it for the first time. So what I did is I built what's called a galaxy clock. I'm not actually creating a galaxy. I'm creating the energy that actually created the galaxy itself. And I'm going to show you how that all works and how that relates to going beyond the speed of light. So the first thing I've done is I've used the distance that light travels per second as one inch on the galaxy clock. Light travels 186,282 miles every second. It's constant. It never changes. It doesn't slow down and then speed up. So because that's a constant, I can use that as a, as a mark on my clock. So every second on each of these wheels spiraling further and further inwards, the galaxy makes one, in one second, each wheel goes one distance of the speed of light. So this distance from here to here is equal to here. So we're going to actually see the movement of electromagnetism, which is what light is, as it moves through these concentric wheels in the galaxy clock. This line here represents gravity, force, and space, and time, which is actually the distance between the center of my clock and the outermost wheel in a, in a much greater distance. And that actually represents a force called gravity that we'll actually see growing as we move through the clock. So what I'm going to do now is, as I've already counted 12 points on the galaxy clock, I'm going to connect all of the relative lines into each concentric wheel, and you're going to start to see what's actually happening in the clock. We're going to see that second number one, this happened. We went from this line to this line. We don't really see much, much change yet. In the second second, connecting each line we can start to see a little bit of a curvature happening in the second line. And the third second, we can see the clock is starting to curve. Space and time is actually starting to curve. The oscillations per second are starting to increase as we move closer to the center of the clock as we move through time. The four second, we can really see things starting to change now. The fifth second, and the sixth second. So, so far in six seconds on the galaxy clock, we've made a half an oscillation in the innermost wheel, and we've made a very insignificant amount of oscillations in the outermost wheel. So as electromagnetism starts to spiral inwards on each concentric wheel as we move inwards, we can see an increase in the oscillations of the waves. One oscillation of a wave would represent one hertz, or one, one hertz in the, in the formula of Max Planck, energy is equal to the frequency of the oscillation of a wave. So we're seeing an increase in the oscillations of waves, therefore we should see an increase in energy, because as, as wave oscillates more times per second, we'll actually see energy increasing according to Planck's formula. We saw the same thing happening in the electromagnetic spectrum. The faster waves oscillated per second, the more energy they produced. We're going to learn how that energy is produced in a moment, but let's, let's go another six counts on the galaxy clock. The seven second. The eighth second. At the eight second point, we're touching we're actually going almost two times the speed of light, according to my theory. We've touched the gravity force space and timeline here, and in the same second we've crossed the speed of light twice. The distance that light travels per second 
is this distance, but we've gone through two of them in one second. So at this point in the galaxy clock, I detect that there's so much energy present that photons and mass are starting to accelerate beyond the speed of light. So here we've gone two times the speed of light. The eighth second. The ninth second, actually. Here we've touched the wheel and we've gone just a little bit past two times the speed of light. The tenth second. All the way to here, we've almost gone two and a half times the speed of light on the tenth second in the innermost wheel. The eleventh second. three times the speed of light in the innermost wheel, and the twelfth second. All the way to twelve. So at this point, we can start to see the formation and the beginning of what looks like, at the twelve count position here, the spiral arm of a galaxy. We can actually see the beginnings of the creation of our own galaxy. Our own galaxy is created by this principle. By this theory, I'm actually showing what is actually happening in our galaxy, how energy is moving, and how creation is happening. The oscillations per second here are one. One oscillation per second here, and not even, if we reached here on the outermost wheel, we, we would be at one quarter of an oscillation in the outermost wheel. So the theory is demonstrating that as electromagnetic energy, light, starts to spiral inwards on smaller and smaller orbits, we see an increase in the oscillations per second and therefore an increase in energy. And as energy increases, um, it, it starts to affect particles, it starts to affect mass. Just as uh, Dr. Earl Van Landingham said that 18 MeV protons could allow spacecraft to do one-tenth the speed of light, so as energy increases, as electromagnetic energy increases, um, as the oscillations increase, when that energy, when mass comes in contact with that energy, it starts to accelerate. But again, um, Einstein's law prohibits that solid mass can go beyond light speed. But there's another phenomenon happening in the galaxy clock. As the frequency of energy increases, so does the frequency of mass. And as mass increases in frequency, in essence it becomes lighter. It becomes less and less mass. So actually, we're taking Einstein's theory in reverse. He's actually correct. Mass cannot attain the speed of light. But if mass becomes less mass, in other words, as its frequency is, ra is raised, mass is reducing. Mass is becoming lighter and lighter and lighter. And if mass can become lighter and lighter and lighter as it attains higher frequency, then mass can actually accelerate towards the speed of light. And in a moment, we're going to build phase two on the galaxy clock. We're going to go, we're going to start from here and go another 12 points and see what happens next. So now we're going to look at phase two of the galaxy clock. We're going to see an even further increase in the oscillation of waves as we, as we evolve in this clock. So we last left off at the 12 count position and we had already broke the speed of light. The frequency of electromagnetism or gravity, the gravity force space and timeline broke the speed of light. I never changed the speed of light on the electromagnetism moving in these, in these spirals as we moved in. On each wheel, the speed of light remained a constant. We never changed the speed of light there. What started to happen was is the, the power and the frequency of gravity of electromagnetism represented by this line started to get so powerful that as we got near the center of the clock and we got to the 12 count position, that force became so powerful and there was so much energy in it that it started to affect mass. And mass, therefore, as it came in contact with these greater charges of energy, started to accelerate. So now we're going to go another 12 counts up to 24 and see what happens. I've already drawn the first line, the 13 line, and we can see what's happening there. And it takes us all the way to this point. So our wave is, is, is growing and it's also, it's also curving more. So the 14th second. 
connecting all the lines at the 14th count on the galaxy clock. We come to the 14th count right here. The 15th second. All the way to the 15th position. The 16th second. Connecting each point on the galaxy clock on each wheel at the 16 count position. We're starting to see what's happening. The 17th count. Connecting each point on each wheel at the 17th count position. We come to here. The 18th count. Connecting each point on the 18th count position. And the 19th count. At this point here, we're at least six times the speed of light because in the same second, while electromagnetism is following the speed of light on the waves, the electromagnetic or gravity force, gravity force space and timeline in the same second is jumping from this point all the way to here. And that represents one, two, three, four, five, six times the speed of light. So it, it's incredible what's starting to happen here. We're starting to see the acceleration of mass going far beyond the speed of light. And one of the things that happens as as photons, as any mass in this high frequency wave state starts to accelerate past the point of light, we're starting to see what's going to happen and what, what is representative of a black hole in the center of our galaxy. I'll explain that in a minute as we finish the clock. The 20th second. Connecting all the points Twenty-first second. And the twenty-second second. Twenty-third second. We're coming down to the last, the last seconds on the clock, and the twenty-fourth. starts to happen here is the, is the oscillations here are increasing so much. Again, as we look at this, as we look at this galaxy clock, we are seeing the creation of our own galaxy. We can, we can look now for a moment at what the core and what a galaxy actually looks like, and we can see the same, same phenomena happening, the same creation is actually happening. So what's actually happening is if we, if we take this spiral into an eternally smaller and smaller and smaller orbit, what starts to happen is the oscillations per second of the wave increase so dramatically as we get into smaller and smaller micro orbits that basically we go into the, the, the millions, the billions, and the trillions, and all the way to a Google. A number that is so high that as, as the oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller, there's actually no end to how small we can go because we can go into the micro universe. And as we go into the micro universe, the oscillations of the wave become so high that the frequency of gravity, the, the energy in the vortex, the gravity for space and timeline is showing us that 
as it's curving and as it's oscillating faster and faster and faster, that mass, as it comes in contact with this force, starts to accelerate. Photons go from a lower frequency wave state into a higher frequency wave state. For example, in the radio spectrum, as we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum earlier, the lowest part of, of the EM spectrum that we know, waves are oscillating at around 1,000 times per second. By the time you get into visible uh, or even radio frequency, you're at 1 million times per second. A wave is oscillating 1 million times per second. That means uh, over a distance of 186,282 miles, if we had a wave that long and we coiled it, it would oscillate a million times in the frequency of radio. In microwaves, you're oscillating a billion times per second. And by the time you get into infrared, you're at a trillion times per second. So when we get into the visible light spectrum, we're, op we're operating and oscillating at numbers that are so high in frequency. So what's happening as this frequency increases is again the force of gravity becomes so strong that, that any mass that becomes in contact with that frequency, photons or even solid mass, the frequency of that mass becomes so high that the mass becomes in essence lighter. In other words, it doesn't have that sort of feeling of weight to it, the, the, the feeling of mass. So it starts to accelerate. So this is starting to tell us what's happening in a black hole in the center of our galaxy. If we look at a black hole, first of all, it appears black. And most scientists think that it's just a tremendous force of gravity in the center of the black hole. And they're right. But what this, what this theory shows is that there's something else happening in a black hole. We're seeing oscillations per second going so fast and that matter, mass, photons, are actually starting to come in contact with this field and at this point, which is known as the event horizon in a black hole, matter is accelerating beyond the speed of light. And if matter accelerates beyond the speed of light, and we view the universe, we take pictures with cameras, when we look at a black hole, you can't see anything because it's oscillating faster than the wavelengths with which we see light with our brains. So we get a void, a picture of a black hole shows it to be black because it's oscillating too fast. It's going beyond the speed of light, so therefore it just appears black. If really we had cameras and wavelengths in our brain capable of seeing into higher frequencies and energies, a black hole would actually be luminous. It would just be a, a greater increase of energy, according to this theory. So as again, as we get smaller and smaller and smaller in, in, in the orbits, the oscillations per second start to go into numbers that the highest number ever counted is a Google. A number per second that we can't even imagine. So at that point, if we, if we could make a spacecraft that could oscillate with energy vibrations anywhere near this point, we would see that spacecraft be capable of producing energies that could allow it to conquer the speeds of light. So what does all this have to do with the UFOs. What does this have to do with the UFOs in this investigation? Well, it wasn't going to be clear to me until a month later after I had this discovery that I actually took pictures of the waves that were pulsating off of the UFOs in the STS-75 tether incident. I actually slowed the video down frame by frame and I took pictures off a TV monitor to actually look at the waves themselves. I really had no idea what I was going to find. But before we go to there, I'm going to explain a few more things about the gravity beyond light speed theory and how this, this model is, is not only showing us what's happening in our galaxy, but also is showing what's happening in our micro universe. In theory, this is just a theory. It's a theory on paper. It would have to be demonstrated and proven to be correct. One experiment done by a physicist named uh, Dr. Randall Mills at a company called Black Light Power if we go into the micro universe, assuming that um, on my galaxy clock here, the distances I'm using, the size of this clock is about 6 million miles across, which is not actually that large in comparison to even our solar system. If this was Earth here and the sun is 93 million miles away, we can see if this is 6 million miles, it's, it's not that big of an amount of space to be having these orbits um, moving through. But assuming we're going, we're getting way into here, and this is the size of an atom, and this is the proton in the middle of the atom, 
and these orbits here are, are layers in which an electron orbits around the proton. The hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. electron. And we all know that hydrogen is a source of fuel and has, is a source of energy. Dr. Randall Mills took, uh, using a chemical process, actually shortened the distance between an electron's orbit in a hydrogen atom. In other words, if an electron was orbiting here, he caused it to jump to, say, here. What would happen if we could change the orbit of an electron from here to here to the energy in a hydrogen atom? According to this theory, the answer is obvious. If the electron jumped from here to here, it would, you would see an increase in the frequency of the oscillation of the electron uh, um, around the proton. Um, here, if, if we go into an innermost wheel, if we, go, if we move into a closer wheel to the center of the proton, you would see an increase in the oscillation of the electron around the proton, and therefore an increase of energy. Well, in Randall Mill's experiments, once he shortened the distance between the electron um, the electrons orbit around the proton, that's exactly what happened. The hydrogen atoms started to produce more energy in the form of actual heat and in the form of actual energy waves. Although Randall Mills doesn't have the same explanation, when I applied his experiment to the galaxy clock, I saw that it fit in perfectly. So even on a micro level in the micro universe, we can see the same thing happening. An increase uh, in oscillations represents an increase in energy. So now I'm going to explain a little bit about going into this process of how electromagnetism increases as oscillations in electric fields increase. We're going to look at a little bit of a different diagram. The evidence of magnetism increasing as oscillations of photons, which are just electromagnetic waves, can be demonstrated in part by the properties of an electromagnet. If we take a conductor rod such as copper or steel and we wrap windings of copper wire around the conductor and run an electric current through the wire, the conductor rod turns into a magnet. This is because as electromagnetism through the wire oscillates around a nucleus, the conductor rod, energy in the form of magnetism, gravity, is produced in the vortex. The energy in the form of magnetism produced is relative to the frequency with which the current oscillates through the wire around the conductor. As the number of windings of wire increase around the metal conductor rod, with the same constant speed flow of energy moving through the wire, the energy in the form of magnetism gravity increases. This is part of what is happening in the galaxy clock. As photons of light waves oscillate into smaller and smaller orbits, the energy produced in the vortex in the form of magnetism gravity is increasing. But in the galaxy clock, electromagnetism moving at the speed of light as a constant can move into infinitely smaller and smaller orbits into the microcosm even, and the frequency of oscillations per second can also increase towards infinity. Thus, magnetism gravity is also going to increase towards infinity. Mesmerized by the amazing pulsing waves from the STS-75 Tether Incident UFOs, I decided to take a look at the waves frame by frame. I felt they might reveal the propulsion system of these giant UFOs. I once asked Dr. Glenn Seaborg, who shared the Nobel Prize with Macmillan for the discovery of plutonium, former chair of the Atomic Energy Commission under Presidents Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon, authorizing all of the nuclear weapons testing at the Nevada test site, about anti-gravity generators being developed by alternative energy developers. He answered me and said, if anyone could build a gravity generator, they would have an energy source far beyond nuclear fusion and I don't believe anyone is doing anything like that yet. On a huge TV screen with a flawless S video VCR and with the help of Steve Orkland, an amazing zero-point energy scientist, we identified and freeze-framed the first pulse of the UFO as it was passing over the top of the 12-mile long tether. We were both astounded and in such awe I could barely speak. It was a profound moment in this investigation. We were looking at what appeared to be a gravity wave with a steep spiral 
radiating from the UFO right out of the Phase 2 galaxy clock. It was the clear signature of a powerful gravity wave that was clearly bending light into the shape of the incredible magnitude of the wave. The wave radiated right out of the black hole in the center of the UFO, and we could see clearly that by the extreme steepness of the wave coming out of the black hole, that the hole was the point where gravity produced in the UFO's propulsion system was faster than light, and because our eyes and cameras could not produce a signal that fast, it appeared black as the mystery that beckoned me with the knowing that the UFOs were capable of utilizing such high frequency gravity waves that they could conquer the speed of light and visit us from another star system. The phase two pulse was equally astounding because it showed an outward pulsing ring, another phenomenon that happened in the galaxy clock when each inner ring completed an oscillation. It produced an outward moving wave and as all the rings in the galaxy clock completed their oscillations, the wave would radiate out to the periphery of the clock. But this was also telling me that the extremely high frequency magnetism gravity produced in the center of the UFO's gravity generator was being distributed throughout its mass. There had to be a reason for this, I thought, but was this the UFO's propulsion system? The phase three pulse was showing the ring moving back towards the center as if to see the galaxy clock moving in the opposite direction. Perhaps they alternated their pulses in time forward with time reverse and there was some reason for doing this. Perhaps this prevented the high frequency pulsing energy from dissipating and keeping the mass of the UFO in a high frequency wave state. I really believe that the answer to our future space program was staring at us with a clear signature from a most profoundly advanced extraterrestrial civilization. But who were they? The answer would take more time. I sent the photographs of the three-phase poles to Dr. Newth and wrote him the following letter on January 22, 2000. Dear Dr. Newth, I just wanted to see if you received the photos from the NASA video I sent you. Also, have you seen the videotape yet? What do you think of the pulsing waves of light in their particular formations? Dr. Newth wrote me back the following letter on February 22, 2000. Dear Mr. Sarita, Yes, I received your photographs and they are indeed quite peculiar. However, at least in the photographs, I have seen nothing that could not be explained as floating debris illuminated through sharp shadows in the shuttle bay. Maybe the videotape shows different things. I will try to see the tape soon. Signed, Joe Newth. In the year 2000, I read on the cover of an old issue of Discover magazine from August of 1998, was Einstein wrong? News broke that a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Raymond Chow, had caused photons to do 1.7 times the speed of light. Dr. Chow did an amazing experiment using atomic clocks to measure the speed at which photons traveled through normal space at the speed of light, and next to this, he ran photons through a quartz glass barrier and they actually tunneled, he said, through the barrier at an astounding 1.7 times the speed of light. When I read the words tunneling photons, I applied them to my galaxy clock and the answer as to why the photons passed through the quartz glass faster than photons that didn't was so obvious. The tunneling photons, which were just electromagnetic waves by my new theory, tunneled in such microscopic orbits that the magnetism gravity produced in the vortex produced more energy than required for photons to do light speed. When the magnetism gravity signal got too powerful, the photons increased in energy frequency, thus they became even more energized and lighter than they already are, and they broke the speed of light. The implications towards understanding this are astounding. Because the energy required for photons to move at the speed of light is a fixed number, and we can now see in the galaxy clock that gravity is increasing towards infinity, the magnetism gravity will eventually conquer the point 
where the energy of gravity will be greater than that needed for photons to move at the speed of light. At this point, where oscillations of waves per second are so high, the energy gravity produced in the vortex will cause photons to move faster than the speed of light. Increase in oscillations of photons, light waves, causes an increase in magnetism gravity. At the center of a galaxy is a black hole where the oscillations of electromagnetism per second grow towards the infinity of a black hole's smaller and smaller orbiting photons and the electromagnetic waves. The smaller and smaller orbiting photons are producing greater and greater increases in gravity at the center of the black hole. When any mass comes in contact with higher and higher frequency magnetism gravity, the mass becomes lighter and lighter until it easily glides towards the speed of light and far beyond. By this new theory, a black hole's event horizon is the point where photons and mass become so light and with such highly quantized electromagnetic energy, they glide faster than the speed of light. The event horizon merely appears black just because as photons and mass are accelerating beyond light speed and we cannot see anything moving that fast, the signal appears void because we can only see events in what I now call relative light speed time. Canadian scientist John Hutchison is the discoverer of what is now known as the Hutchison effect. I met with him in the year 2001 to learn about his work and to show him the galaxy clock and gravity beyond light speed theory. His work demonstrated the principle perfectly. He was the first scientist to change the frequency of mass from a low 7 to 8 hertz wave state to a higher frequency. He did this in an amazing experiment where he bombarded a 75 pound cannonball with high frequency waves produced by Tesla coils, radio waves and Van de Graaff waves. As the 75 pound ball absorbed the high frequency magnetic waves, its mass became lighter and so light that it actually started to levitate. If we can change the frequency of mass into a high frequency wave state, it can eventually turn into a form so light that the energy required for propulsion for a spacecraft would reduce or become more efficient and allow us to experience less and less inertia, therefore experience less g-force in spaceflight. If mass could become so light that it became as light as a photon, Mass or spacecraft could attain the speed of light with very little energy in the form of actual propulsion. If mass or spacecraft could transform into such a high frequency wave state that it went far beyond the frequency of waves in the visible light spectrum, mass or spacecraft could become invisible. Higher yet, mass or spacecraft could break the speed of light. Now it was very clear to me how the UFOs were traveling beyond light speed. They were pulsing their spacecraft with such high frequency waves of energy that the spacecraft reduced its mass to the point that it became so light, lighter than a photon, and when mass becomes that light, it takes so little energy for it to move at the speed of light and beyond. The answer to how we could propel ourselves to the stars was being transmitted to us in the form of a gravity beyond light speed energy wave, the very signature to how a spacecraft could break the speed of light and visit us from outside our own solar system and possibly from one of our nearest stars. In 1996, just after the STS-75 tether incident, NASA opened the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Lab, a new project at NASA designed to look at advanced concepts in space energy and propulsion, even beyond light speed theories. Was it a coincidence? In 1998, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, an American physicist who heads the NASA Advanced Space Propulsion Lab near Houston, Texas, an astronaut on board the space shuttle STS-75 tether incident mission, suddenly developed a new type of propulsion rocket drive system for NASA. Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz had invented a revolutionary type of rocket engine that utilizes high-energy pulsed 
electromagnetic waves called the Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket. The key words were pulsed and electromagnetic waves. Did Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz see something on STS-75, the same UFOs we are seeing on the video today? Was he trying to reverse engineer the kind of physics that he thought he was seeing radiating from the UFOs? You're about to see what we call the interdimensional shift sequence. It's an amazing sequence because it shows something actually moving from one dimension into another. A, a UFO that appears to just suddenly come from nowhere as if from another dimension. But now we have a little bit of an idea of what that actually means. You're going to see the curvature of the Earth down here, and you're going to see a lot of lightning flashes on the ground here. And then you're, you're going to see a brightly glowing object kind of moving very slowly into frame here, and then it kind of just stops around here. And there'll be a lot of uh, what appear to be, again, what NASA will try to tell us are shooting stars or meteorites streaking by, some of them actually leaving the Earth. You're going to see things coming straight in and disappearing into the clouds. It's really a powerful scene. But watch up here. At about this point in the screen, keep your eyes focused there because all of a sudden, out of the black void of space, above the Earth, a disk with the familiar, the familiar shape just suddenly, out of nowhere, just appears. How did this happen? The space shuttle's actual cameras, the black and white cameras that we're looking at, can see into the near ultraviolet, uh, a frequency of light that humans can't see because it's too high in energy. We know that if the UFO is actually mass vibrating at a high frequency wave state, all of the UFO has to do is go into a higher level of energy and it can simply suddenly disappear. But in reverse, if the UFO were actually already in a higher frequency than the cameras could detect, somewhere up in the far ultraviolet or the X-ray or gamma ray spectrum, all it has to do is slow its energy down to that equal to the, the energy levels of the, the near ultraviolet or the visible light and suddenly the UFO would appear. I remember in 1968 when I saw the first and only daylight UFO I'd ever seen. For over half an hour I watched with hundreds of people in amazement in Berkeley, California in 1968 looking up into the sky and we watched this disk, this incredibly visible metallic disk just hover there and all of a sudden blinking out and disappearing in a matter of a second. It didn't accelerate and go somewhere else, it actually just disappeared. So essentially the UFO I saw in 1968 did the same thing but in reverse of what you're seeing here. This UFO is doing the opposite. It's slowing down in energy and suddenly just appears in our dimension and all of a sudden it just kind of drifts by and you'll see a lot of other exciting things in this part of the video. As the space shuttle is moving in a prograde orbit around the Earth at 18,000 miles per hour, seen moving from right to left, we can now see a large disk-shaped unidentified flying object accelerating from the lower right beyond the speed of the space shuttle. Now the object slows down and appears to be hovering, an illusion caused as it flies at the same speed as the shuttle, as if following it, an impossible feat for a natural object. We see lightning flashes down on the ground and objects moving in all sorts of different directions down below. And now an object streaks by at amazing speed, far faster than the speed of any meteorite or shooting star or known manned spacecraft. Now in the center of the screen, we can see an unidentified flying object suddenly appearing, giving off a tremendous luminosity as it appears to be moving from the higher dimension of energies into a dimension where the visible wavelengths of the camera could observe its light. As we now understand the electromagnetic spectrum and that the human eyes can only see the visible light spectrum, when an unidentified flying object moves from an energy dimension 
into our visibility, it is clearly changing frequency of its entire mass from a purely quantized energy state and lowering it to a level of energy where we can actually observe it. This demonstrates that the UFOs are capable of altering the frequency of their mass and their craft from solid mass into pure energy and light and thus can attain the speed of light. It is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. Voltaire. The ancient megalithic ruin Stonehenge, believed to be constructed by the ancient Druids in approximately 2900 BC, embraces the midsummer sunrise and beckons the stars above on Salisbury Plain near Wiltshire in southern England. Many astronomers believed it was an ancient clock to the sun, moon, and the stars with precise alignment patterns that continue to mystify scientists today. Was our ancient past about to reveal a mystery so great that it would wait until we realized that our very own future was inside of our past? Across from Stonehenge in a farmer's field in 1996, the same year as the NASA STS-75 tether incident, a crop circle appeared with the identical message of the gravity wave pulsating from the UFO. It was a crop circle with the nearly exact same degree of a spiraling wave curvature even with the hole in the center, just as the NASA STS-75 pulsing UFO revealed. Were intelligent beings trying to send us a message so clear and with such regularity that it was intended for us to decode? Was the message the secret to their propulsion systems and a gravity generator energy source capable of solving our environmental energy pollution crisis? In 1938, a Chinese and Tibetan team of archaeologists led by Chinese professor Chai Pu Tei from the University of Beijing discovered an astounding burial site high in the mountains of Bayan Kara Ula on the border of Tibet and China. The Chinese Tibetan team found a grave site containing the skeletal remains of what appeared to be tiny people with large bulbous heads. The team found that the cave area is still inhabited by two tribes that have some of the same physical attributes. They are frail in their bodies and stand between 3 foot 6 and 4 foot 7 with an average height of 4 foot 2. The two tribes are known today as the Hans and the Zopas. But then the research team found evidence of an extraterrestrial origin. They found a series of large stone round discs in the burial caves. The discs were round, had a square notch cut out of the side with a hole in the middle and a spiraling groove of ancient written characters spiraling out from the center that would be later translated by a Chinese scientist named Dr. Sum Um Nui in 1962. In 1965, 716 more grooved dropa stone discs were discovered in the same burial caves. The researchers were told by the local tribespeople that the stone discs marked an event that happened some 12,000 years ago. When we compare this amazing NASA UFO photo to the Dropa stone disks, we can see an astounding perfect match. We can see a disk-shaped UFO, a black hole in the center, the square notch cut out of the side, and a spiraling wave radiating out from the center of the disk to the rim, all identical to the 12,000-year-old Dropa stones. Could this be the very signature? 
that an ancient civilization wanted us to see? Could these ancient peoples of China and Tibet have recorded an event 12,000 years ago describing UFOs right down to a magnetic pulsing wave of energy? In the early 1960s, Professor Tsum Am Nui broke the code of the characters written in the tiny writing of the spiraling groove of the Dropa Stone. Eventually, the translation of the disc was published. The translation revealed that some 12,000 years ago, a spacecraft from another planet had crash landed in the local mountains. A deep rumbling shook the ground, frightening the animals and the local people. They saw a glowing ball of light shaped like a disc streaking across the sky, which crash landed into the forest. The hunters were afraid. When the hunters found the disc-shaped craft, they described it as shiny with an opening in the side of it hence the square notches, and they saw something moving inside. The story further reveals that the Dropa Stones were ancient artistic stone carvings depicting the crash-landed spacecraft. The similarity to the modern NASA UFOs was astounding. Could this be a signature to tell us just whom our modern-day visitors are? Carved on the wall of the caves was a drawing that showed a pictograph of the rising sun, the moon, unidentifiable stars, and the earth, all joined together by lines of pea-sized dots, possibly indicating the origin of the star people who had crash-landed on the earth 12,000 years ago. But what if the dots could tell us what star system the aliens came from? In 1947, after viewing a Dropa stone disk, English scientist Dr. Carl Robin Evans learned that the Zopa tribe's language he later learned from Lurgan La, the religious guardian of the Zopa people, the history of the Zopa people's origins. He was told that they originally came to Earth from a planet in the star system of Sirius about 20,000 years ago. Now if we could assume that the NASA UFOs, by their amazing identical signature to the Dropa Stones, the disk shape, the black hole in the center, and the spiraling groove, the square notch cut out of the side, were from the very same place the star system of Sirius, we might know just whom our modern day visitors are. Could beings from Sirius be visiting Earth today? The Zopa religious leader told Dr. Carl Robin Evans that there was a curiosity to their Syrian ancestors' visits to Earth. From different sources we have 10,000 BC from Dr. Sum Um Nui to 18,000 BC to the year 1014 AD. Considering the curiosity to the Syrian visits to Earth, could NASA astronauts and Earth have been visited by the same beings back in 1996? The similarities are too astounding to ignore, and they will get even deeper as the star Sirius shines 8.7 light years away from Earth. I would then be led to read Robert Temple, a British astronomer's book, The Sirius Mystery. An obscure tribal people of Mali, northwest Africa called the Dogons, isolated from the outside world for countless centuries, are guardians to sacred knowledge about the star system of Sirius, knowledge that has migrated with their highest priests from pre-dynastic Egypt earlier than 3000 BC. They spoke of highly advanced astronomical knowledge of the Sirius star system. The Dogon priests actually had maps of the star system of Sirius. Long ago, they actually said Sirius had an A star and it had a B and a C star. And both the B and the C star would revolve in an elliptical orbit around the main star every 50 years. So you would have a 50 year orbit of the B and the C star. At this point in time, we had only seen the B star. And when Robert Temple wrote his book in 1972, he didn't know anything about the evidence of actually finding the C star. So at this point, it seemed like a myth. No one really knew if these Dogon priests were accurate with modern astronomy. But in 1995, two French astronomers actually detected the existence of Sirius C. And when they did their measurements on it, they actually found that both B and C did indeed have an elliptical orbit around the star system of Sirius every 50 years, to, precisely as the Dogon priests had, had told. Also, in 1997, the same two uh, French astronomers detected planets orbiting around the stars in Sirius B and C. So this would indicate the possibility of life. 
that beings could actually come from there. So if the Dogons were accurate about all this other information, and it wasn't just some sort of ancient myth, then perhaps they were even accurate about what they also knew about the very beings who came from the star system Sirius. The African Dogon tribe's priests prophesied the return of the Syrian gods and goddesses to Earth, whom they call the Nomos. They say the return of the Nomos will be called the Day of the Fish, as the Syrians were known as aquatic beings, half fish and half human. If we see this African Dogon priest drawing of what ancestral knowledge says the ancient Nomos looked like, we can see the image of a spacecraft attached to a large fishtail, an image that beckons us with the profound symbology used by ancient peoples to describe the amphibious quality of these ancient beings from planets in the Sirius star system. Now if we assume that these Syrian Nomo gods and goddesses were amphibious and had to travel all the way from Sirius 8.7 light years away from Earth, they would need water to encapsulate their bodies in while they were in deep space transit. Now the mystery is unfolding. Robert Temple wrote in his book, The Serious Mystery, published in 1976, we should not forget that if aquatic amphibious beings are making an interstellar voyage, they will need fresh water in their ship in considerable quantities. As this investigation began with NASA scientist Dr. Louis A. Frank's detection of water balls, the connection to Sirius was pointing towards water once again. Dr. Frank really believes these are balls of water, water balls the size of small houses entering our Earth at a rate of 10 to 20 million impacts a year. But remember the problem that Dr. Newth came up with. Because the water balls, there were so many of them entering our Earth's atmosphere, so many, he detected that no satellite has a chance of surviving days, let alone years, if these were actually meteors. In fact, the space shuttle he felt him that could be, should actually be struck by one of these objects. Yet he said no satellite has ever been struck by one of these objects. A fact that actually disturbed Joseph New so much that he doesn't actually believe these things are water. And remember I detected the only possible answer for the, that to occur would be if the water balls were going around the satellites. Actually going around them and that would detect intelligence. The ancient Dogon priests actually describe the Syrians traveling in watery-like spacecraft from the star system Sirius to kind of encapsulate these half-fish, half-human gods in their transit from this star system 8.7 light years away. Watery spacecraft, watery balls. And when we take that all the way back to Dr. Frank's discovery at NASA of water balls, these incredible water balls, so many of them, it seemed to come together there was an amazing coincidence that I couldn't ignore. There was a distinct possibility that these water balls were actually Syrians in transit to Earth. Or even another possibility, because they were gods of water, they would be masters of water. And perhaps some of these water balls were actually their craft, but others may have actually literally been balls of water being dropped on our Earth to help heal our ozone layer. Because as I explained earlier, water eventually breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen under intense solar radiation and therefore with the oxygen would eventually transmutate into O3 which is ozone. So could ancient Syrian gods be actually helping us heal, heal our ozone layer? Temple further wrote that the Dogon spoke of an interstellar ship being encased in a thin metal shell probably manufactured in the solar system which is essentially hollow perhaps even largely empty, like a balloon or containing water at the center, suitably insulated and heated. Temple was inadvertently describing Dr. Louis A. Frank's discovery of the mysterious water balls, which were so high in energy they evaded detection on infrared satellites, probably because they were encased with a radiant barrier, Temple's thin metal shell, to protect them from the intense radiation from the sun and other cosmic rays. But Dr. Frank made his first discovery in 1985, unpublished at the time. And Temple wrote and published his book, The Serious Mystery, in 1976, nine years earlier. In fact, he never even wrote about or learned of Dr. Frank's water comet mystery. We should not forget the Dogon priests say the Nomos will return, and when they do, it will be called the Day of the Fish. 
The first indication of their return, say the Dogon, will be that a new star will appear in the sky, the star of the tenth moon. Could the new stars of the tenth moon be the same as the enormous two to three mile wide UFO seen on the NASA STS-75 mission in 1996? The Dogon priests also say that the elements which are at the moment retracted inside the body will re-emerge. Then the nomos will re-emerge. Then the nomos will land on the earth again in their ark, the landing craft. From this ark will emerge the mythical ancestors, namely the very same personalities who figure in all the myths. So there will presumably be political implications to their arrival. After their return, this group of nomos will rule from the waters as they are masters of water. Seven thousand years ago, in Babylonian mythology, there was a god named A, later called Oines by the Greeks, who suddenly emerged from the ocean. A was a water god. He was depicted with the upper body of a man and the lower body of a fish. According to ancient peoples, he taught architecture, math, astronomy, and early sciences to help humankind come out of the dark ages and enter civilization. Oin's fish-tailed feminine counterpart, the moon goddess Atargatis, was the earliest mermaid deity. She was the predecessor of the Greek love goddess Aphrodite, and water was their primordial element. Columbia and the satellite to now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The home of the Dogon tribe who prophesied the return of the Syrian gods and goddesses, the Nomos, was in Mali, northwest Africa. Was it a coincidence that the shuttle was passing directly over northwest Africa, their precise location during the astounding incident when the tethered satellite was swarmed by UFOs with the signature of the star system of Sirius written all over them? But as the Dogon priests were keepers of this ancient knowledge from pre-dynastic Egypt around 3000 BC, and the shuttle would be passing directly over Egypt within a few moments, it appeared as yet another coincidence beyond reason. We had to look at what the Egyptians knew about the star system of Sirius. Because the Dogon tribe migrated to northwest Africa originally from Egypt in 3000 BC, we would have to look at what the ancient Egyptians knew about the star system of Sirius and the great gods and goddesses who came to earth thousands of years ago and brought humankind from primitive life to modern civilization. Because today we may have an indication that they have returned, perhaps to bring us to yet a higher level of civilization. In Robert Temple's book, The Serious Mystery, we learn of the Syrian water god connection to ancient Egypt from the ancient Greek father of history, Herodotus, who studied in Egypt during his life in the 5th century BC. Herodotus details an amazing connection to Sirius and water when he recounts how the ancient Egyptians channeled large amounts of water through canals from the Nile River called Sirius in ancient times to the many sacred temples, sites, and the pyramids themselves. The ancient kings had their own burial chambers filled with water to emulate their gods and goddesses likeness to water. Even Kefren's pyramid had a passage bringing water in from the Nile which encircled it like an island in which the ancients said the great Cheops lies symbolizing the ancient god of Egypt as an amphibian. Herodotus described how the incredible maze of canals and passages bringing water to so many of the sacred temples and shrines even the pyramids themselves was a sight that he felt surpassed even the pyramids themselves. The great Egyptian goddess Isis, the wife of the chief of the Egyptian god Osiris, symbolized as the all-seeing eye, was herself also symbolized as an all-seeing eye with a throne. Osiris was said by one of Aristotle's companions who visited Egypt heard of an ancient myth that Osiris could not walk because his legs were grown together. Does this tell us once again that he too was an amphibian from the star system of Sirius? Known to the ancient Egyptians as the star system Sirius herself, Isis tells that, I am she who goes out to the dog star. 
Because she is the wife of Osiris, they must both be the same kind of beings, and they must both be from the same star system of Sirius. Isis spoke of her travels to the star system of Sirius, so how did she travel there? Was she actually just visiting Earth from Sirius? Did she travel to Earth from Sirius in a spacecraft? Being a goddess of water, would she travel between Earth and Sirius in a watery spacecraft, just as the Dogons told? Both the Dogon and Isis called Sirius the dog star and symbolized it as a dog. But why? Perhaps it was because the great Egyptian god Anubis symbolizes a half-man, half-dog. God was said to be the god of the star system Sirius by the ancient Egyptians. Anubis was also known as the god of the dead who would guide the pharaohs and the spiritually adept of ancient Egypt upon their death in a celestial boat to their heavens in the star system of Sirius. The mystery as to what caused the water erosion around the Sphinx has baffled archaeologists since its discovery. The water erosion markings were much too high on the Sphinx to suggest that the Nile River had ever flooded that high. But Herodotus' accounts of channeling water to fill small lakes that encompassed the shrines of their Syrian gods and goddesses. Could the ancient Egyptians have built these giant water receptacles to make a place to stay for their half-human, half-amphibian gods and goddesses as they would visit them from the star system of Sirius? The mystery of the Sphinx revealed itself to Robert Temple as a half-dog, half-human, instead of the half-human, half-lion pervading theory. Temple argues that the body of the Sphinx is too long in its torso to be a body of a lion, as lions have rather short torsos, whereas dogs have very long ones. So Temple felt that the body of the Sphinx was a dog, as an emulation of the Syrian god Anubis, symbolizing what the Dogon tribe called the dog star Sirius. But once again, Temple extracts from the Greek historian Herodotus that the body of the Sphinx was originally lying in a man-made lake surrounded by water, explaining the mystery as to why the Sphinx was so eroded by water at such a high level. This also demonstrated that Anubis was a god of the waters. As the great gods of Sirius living in Egypt were masters of water and presumably knew how to manipulate the waters, could they send in direct balls of water from deep space and bring rain in large quantities and transform the arid deserts into a thriving oasis with rich agriculture? It was written that Egypt in ancient times had a rich and thriving agriculture. Could these ancient masters of water have turned a desert into an oasis because they had such power over the waters? We are reminded of the many great miracles of mastery over water when Moses had God part the Red Sea, when God caused the great flood in the time of Noah and warned him of the flood well in advance of its arrival. Could this be because Noah's God had mastery over water and he knew the flood was coming because God just had to send huge amounts of water in from deep space and have it rain down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights? We are also reminded of the many miracles of Jesus Christ where he walked on the water and turned the sea into wine and he commanded the sea to a calm when his disciples feared that the severest ocean storm would claim their lives, once again showing mastery over water. Robert Temple also wrote in his book, The Serious Mystery, that the Dogons actually believed that Jesus too was a nomo from the star system of Sirius and therefore a god who had mastery over the waters. The great masters of water could also direct and send giant balls of water down onto our Earth's atmosphere, guiding them around satellites and the shuttle to prevent collisions, and the water would eventually transform under solar radiation into hydrogen and oxygen, and the oxygen would transmutate into ozone, yet another benevolent act by the ancient goddesses and gods to help heal our failing ozone layer. Former science advisor to Walter Cronkite, Richard Hoagland, a profound space researcher, discovered that on May 27, 1999, NASA launched space shuttle mission number STS-96 at 6.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 
three years after the STS-75 tether incident, with the star system of Sirius at 33.33 degrees from the horizon at the launch site in Cape Canaveral, Florida. But why was Sirius at precisely 33.33 degrees during this launch, the highest symbol of enlightenment in Masonic wisdom? Because all of the founding fathers of the Constitution of the United States of America were highest degree Masons, and that the Washington monuments were all designed in the order of perfect architecture and masonry, this was no coincidence. Even the United States $1 bill seen with the pyramid with an eye hovering above it was a symbol used by the ancient Egyptians for their chief god, Osiris, the husband to Isis, the gods of the Sirius star system. Were the highest powers at NASA using symbology to tell the star system of Sirius that they had understood just who our visitors are and that we have received their message and we were sending a reply that said, yes, we understand who you are and that you have returned.